All right. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the second of the Insider Guides industry, well, uh, sorry, the student webinar series that we're doing uh, for international students around Australia and overseas who are coming to Australia hopefully soon, once the, uh, once the borders open up, uh, hopefully soon. Um, yeah, and we'd like to welcome you all to, a, to a, an employability webinar about how to boost your chances of employment. Uh, my name is James Martin. I am the Managing Director at Insider Guides. We are uh, at the Australia's leading media company for international students that really tries to uh, you know, uh, prepare, welcome and support international students uh, that come to Australia. And um, I'd like to welcome you all here today. We're, we've got a really exciting panel uh, for, for to, to, to go through and I'll, I'll introduce them all in a second. This is, a, this is an interactive webinar. This is a Q&A format. Please feel free to ask questions, uh, write comments in the chat box, talk to us, we'll talk back. Uh, we have a poll, we'd love you to answer, the, answer some questions and, uh, and get, a, get an insight into, into where you're at. Obviously, it's a difficult time for international students here in Australia, as it is for uh, everyone around the world. And um, you know, we hope that, that in Australia, uh, that, that you see that you know, we're in a better position uh, than, uh, than many other countries. And that while there, is, you know, there are struggles with employability, uh, that, that problem is occurring in, in other countries as well. So, um, but thank you all for, for coming today. The, we're gonna keep doing these uh, hopefully every week. Uh, for the next few weeks as well, we'll, 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 we'll keep trying to do uh, webinars in this series. This, this webinar is uh, also uh, funded by the City of Sydney's uh, grant and, and, and on behalf of uh, CESA, which is the Council of International Students Australia. Um, I'll introduce our speakers, and I'm really excited to have these two speakers. I think they're gonna add some really interesting insights into the world of employability. Lynn Trezais, uh, Lynn was appointed National Payroll Manager for South Corp Wines, which turned into Treasury Wine Estates. It's one of the, la la the leading alcohol companies in the world, uh, where she stayed for 18 years and took on responsibility for HR services. In this role, she extended HR and payroll service to delivery into global regions, particularly Asia, America, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And throughout her career, her passion has always been with people. And today, we're looking forward to seeing this passion to support international students in Australia. Lynn, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We've also got Jared Holland here. Jared is a, he's no stranger to the international student community. He is a, he's, he's a chartered accountant by trade and has been a business advisor with a demonstrated history of working in the middle market and startup sector for over 15 years. With a master's in entrepreneurship and innovation under his belt, Jared founded Outcome Life in 2015 to solve the problem of employability for international students. And Gerard has also founded several other technology-driven uh, technology businesses and is passionate about introducing technology-enabled solutions to education and employment pathways. Jared, welcome to the webinar today. Glad to be here, James. Thank you for having me. Great. We've already got ten people commenting in the in the chat. We've got a it's a it's a very uh, lively bunch. Hello, everybody, um, all around the world. Uh, we've got one someone from New Zealand here as well. Got someone from Darwin has popped up. So this is great. Um, Lynn, start with you. I mean, you have extensive experience working on, I guess, the other side of the of the employability. Uh, um, interview process where you've, you've probably hired thousands of people over the time. Um, and, you know, just working in HR in different industries around the world, what is your real world advice for an international student who's looking for employment while they're studying and after graduation? Yeah. I've, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, it's a good one. I think, um, you know, my, my take on that is while you're studying, it's, it's a really good time to, to explore and get clear on what you want um, in the future. So by that, I mean, um, you know, I think it's keeping an open mind at this time and not getting too fixated necessarily on a particular job that you think you're hunting down. Um, spending some time to really explore yourself. Um, there's lots of great tools out there like strength finders um, that you can engage with and just so you get a really clear picture of what you're good at um, and what you enjoy doing. So um, knowing that, you know, you, you're really good at crunching numbers or um, 
you're very customer oriented and that's, that's sort of your passion versus being creative or analysing data. So getting a picture on, on you and what your strengths are. Um, also, you know, what makes you happy and think back to a time where you've done something and feel afterwards that you've really achieved success and, and think about what happened then. What, what was it that made you feel like that? Um, and equally, what is it that you don't like doing? So you've got, you know, just a picture and you're not going to go into roles where you're going to be desperately unhappy and doing work that, that that's not what you want to do and um, it's not fair for you or your employer, to be honest, a bit of a waste of time. So, for example, you know, I know I prefer to work um, in a team um, rather than on my own. So I'll be looking for jobs where I'm going to be surrounded by people or, or managing or working within a team. So all of those things, I think, can help um, kind of put together a bit of a picture, a profile, um, and help you be a bit clearer about what you want in terms of um, a job and a role and the culture, perhaps, that you want to be supported by. And even thinking about are there some non-negotiables um, that, you know, you don't want to work for perhaps certain organisations that aren't aligned to your, you know, your values or the, their ethos isn't quite aligned. So you're going to be unhappy working there. Yeah, it's, what, yeah, there's lots of things to, to unpack there. I mean, obviously, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of international students who'd be, be looking at that and going, well, that's excellent advice. I guess they would also be thinking, well, you know, it is a, we're in a global pandemic. I don't have a lot of choice. <laughs> uh, and it's, exactly. it's, not an, it's not an easy time. But, Jared, I'd like to bring you in here. I mean, you've got, you, you started Outcome Life. And I'd love to hear about what, what, uh, what drew you to start a business focused on supporting international students and also touching on what Lynn talked about just in her, in her advice. Yeah, I think drawing upon that is a, one thing that you'll work at in your career. It, you will not follow the path that you thought you were going to follow. No one does. You never will. It's not linear. It goes all over the place. And, and I'm no exception to that. I, uh, seven years ago, if someone said oh, I was going to be working in, in international education and, and really trying to help international students get jobs, I, I would have been absolutely dumbfounded. I, 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 didn't, I didn't, wouldn't have expected that to happen. Um, and so keeping an open mind is, you know, so what Lynn was talking about too, is that be very open-minded in, in where you are going to go and, and head in your career. So myself, I'm actually, a, a, as James said early on, I'm, I'm a chartered accountant. I spent 10 years at, um, you know, the leading uh, consulting and advisory firms and a couple of years in London working in investment banking as well. And one of my clients was in international education. And that was how I got insights into the industry. Um, and I was doing a master's of entrepreneurship at the same time. And I was... To be honest, I was pretty dissatisfied with, um, as a country, how we treated international students. Uh, there was too much of an emphasis on recruiting international students to the unis and the colleges, and a disproportionate amount of time, money, effort, resources spent on actually working out what happens at the end of a degree and what the outcome is. My view is that the reason why people will invest 50, 100 grand on a degree is because they want a job in that field. Right? Not everyone wants to go into research. Very few percentage actually wants to do that. People want a job. And so I sort of looked at and thought, well, you know what? There's not enough happening to actually help with employment, for, particularly for international students. And long story short is I, I quit my, my nice job where I got paid every two weeks and we started Outcome.life um, with the sole purpose of helping international students get jobs um, in, either in Australia or when they get back home. Um, so that's our mandate um, and um, mm. it's what we do every day. And what are they telling you about finding work? Yeah, so good question, James. It, we, we hear every excuse under the sun uh, and there are a few that, there's probably five that come to mind about some of the barriers that international students see and I'll quickly list them and then I'll, I'll come back to them and I'll, I'll elaborate a bit, but I've applied for 300 jobs and no one gets back to me. I have a master's degree, someone should just give me a job. I don't have any experience, yet employees keep asking for experience. I don't have full working rights. My English isn't good enough. I only want to work in the big four. So these are the things we, we hear all the time. And if I quickly just um, sort of speak about each one of them, I've applied for 300 jobs and no one will get back to me. You are doing it the wrong way. You need to play in the hidden job market. And you need, I'm going to probably reference a, a, a term a few times, breadth versus depth. And what I mean by that is that we meet too many students that are just applying for hundreds and hundreds of jobs on SEEK. And then they get really upset when the hiring manager being Lynn doesn't 
personally reply to them. Now, if in Lynn's business, she was going to reply to every application, they would have to hire four full-time staff that all they do is reply to every single person. That is how many applications come through for graduate roles. I can guarantee if I put up a role for an accountant tomorrow or tonight, by tomorrow I, ha I will have 400 applications. It's physically impossible. And you are not differentiated when you're applying for role and seek. Right? So depth versus breadth. You want to go deep in how you apply for a job. You want to go and research Treasury Wines Estate and find out who works there. Now, a good example is just before this webinar started, I looked up Lynn on LinkedIn and I saw that she's connected to Ben Dowd. Now, I played footy with Ben Dowd for 10 years. So if I wanted to get a job at Treasury with Lynn, I would call up Ben, I'd go and have a coffee with him, and I'd say, tell me everything you know about Lynn and how I can make sure, one, I get an interview with her and how I absolutely nail that interview. My chance of getting a, an interview with Lynn is 10 times higher than anyone else, and I've also got a higher chance of converting into a job. That's what I mean by depth. Mm. Go really, really deep into the places you want to work and the opportunities you want to get. Can I ask it? I'll just, just bring Lynn in there. Lynn, do you agree with that approach as, a, as, a, as sort of personalising the approach to that extent? Uh, totally. And, and I absolutely agree. And Australia is probably a great example of where networks are crucial. And um, every, I think all the stats will tell you your likelihood of getting a role through a network is so much greater than um, just cold calling or randomly applying for, for roles. Yeah. So absolutely agree with that. And LinkedIn I, is a fantastic yeah. resource to be able to see who's connected to who. Um, and mm. yeah, it, it's a really good insight. Well, it's, um, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's harder for an international student because a lot of them don't have the network yeah. in Australia. Yeah. Jared, what um, what would you say about that? I mean, I mean, you you were to to keep going with your point uh, of, of some of the some of the issues to find meaningful work. Um, that was one of them. What were the others? Um, so, the, well, network is one, and and network is you have to work at it. Like, mm. I didn't have a network when when I was young, but when I moved when I moved to London, I had to go and build a network. So, it is something you have to work at over and over and over again, and it is just as important as your study. So. The network one is you have to work at it. Um, having a master's degree, there's never been more people with a master's degree in the world than there is right now. So you're not differentiated by a master's degree. You're the same as everyone else. So don't hang your hat and thinking, oh, I've got my degree, I'll get a job. It's not the 1980s. It doesn't work like that anymore. So what you have to work out is what other things can you bring to the table? What self-learning have you done? Do you know the software that the business uses? How do you differentiate yourself from everyone else that has a master's degree? Really important. Another one was um, the experience side of thing. Employers want you to have experience. Well, as disappointing as it is, that is the world we live in. Employers do not want to wear the learning curve anymore. They do not want to have to take the three months to train you. So it's much better if they go and hire someone who already has experience. But then students will say, well, how do I get experience if no one will give me experience? And it's a very good question. The best way I believe to do that is make sure you've done an internship, do two internships if you can, because once you're in an internship, you are getting industry experience, you're getting local experience, and it is the best place to build a network. Okay. Um, on the English side, oh, sorry, James. No, I, I just think it's, it's, it's really interesting what you're saying about internships. And I think we'll, we'll get to that, uh, especially on, in particular, the work of outcome.life and, and how you did that. I'd like to bring in Lynn now a little bit, though, just to just obviously Lynn's got this. You've got this amazing insight into, you know, hiring and, and really have it being on the coal face and, and seeing what needs to happen for you to stand out when you are hiring people and what really brings people to the top of the pile. What catches your attention? Um, can I just ask you, Lynn, straight out, what would be your top tips for standing out in an, in an interview? In an interview or your resume? So I guess both, <laughs> both. both. And yeah, okay. both. I mean, I mean, if we, if we, I mean, there are a lot of students who put forward resumes, don't even get to an interview. So mm -hmm. I guess in just in chance of how do, how do they get your attention? Mm -hmm. um, and just digressing slightly, um, Jared um, shared with me that he knew my LinkedIn connection, Ben, from playing footy together. So it's not always about who you've worked with too. So getting these networks in all these ways that, um, you know, it might be the person you see in the coffee shop every morning that you start engaging with too. So, you know, it, there's lots of ways of building your networks um, without being in employment. Um, in terms of standing out, 
I guess if it is, if they are big organisations you're going for roles with, um, your resume these days um, likely to be scanned and there's a lot of AI coming in where the keyword searches are popping up. So it's important to, to know that, um, you know, you've got the job description of the, the role that you're going for and if it's not published, ring up and ask for it, read it you know, many, many times so you're familiar with the role and then make sure your resume is really targeted at that role and the words you're using in there are, are really picking up on that. So that's, that's a really interesting point. So you're, you're saying you're saying when someone puts together a resume, just make sure that it's not like a generic resume, really targeted, think about exactly that, you know, you have to be applying for that, that position, think about what the other person would is, is looking for in that resume and just... Yeah, I think I think that is something that a lot of, or not just students, but a lot of people do this. They just they just yeah, as Jared mentioned before, send send hundreds of resumes around and hope for the best. Doesn't work. Yeah, yeah and if you know if you're really targeting a role, I think you've got to write a resume that's targeting that role. So which might mean tweaking some of your achievements in there that are really going to address that resume. So not all organisations are using AI. I mean, there's still a lot where they're coming through. So you've got to be able to grab attention quickly to keep it simple. Um, my resume with my 40 years of <laughs> work experience um, is, you know, two and a half pages. So it doesn't, that would be max, you know, don't keep it under three pages, keep it simple, lots of white space. Um, so it's laid out nicely. So, so when you're looking at it, it's appealing. So if people are actually opening up and you know I've spoken to recruiters and um, we've gone through resumes and they've said and they've actually sent me one that I like the look of this and they the rest they're just not looking at because they can't be bothered reading it all <laughs> so you really have to grab attention quickly they always say that in, when you're doing copywriting courses and I'm a, I'm a big fan of advertising that advertising world you know the, the goal of the headline is to get you to read the first line of the copy and the goal of the first line of the copy is to get you to read the second and then third and then it's really about capturing attention making it look good so i think there is something to to mm -hmm. say when it comes to the content but the the design and the layout jared what do you think about that so it's important to know you don't get a job with your cv you get a job in the interview mm -hmm. so you actually want to play the game at a higher level at, a, at play the game differently lynn just mentioned that sitting down with recruiters, they would honestly look at a CV for under five seconds, I reckon. That is how fast they flick through. So the example that Lynn and I have already referred to where Ben, my mate, who I saw on LinkedIn, if Ben sends my CV through to Lynn, I've probably already got an interview. I have cut out that whole interview process, the whole CV assessment process. And that's, that's when we talk about breadth versus depth. That's the game you need to play. You don't want to be a 401st CV that people are looking through because they are just going to flick over you. Statistically, it's impossible to actually get an interview. You've got to make sure that you have a competitive advantage over anyone else that's applying because you have the inside running. And it's not that hard to do it. You can use LinkedIn is so powerful that it took me five seconds to realize that I knew someone that we knew on LinkedIn. So, Find companies that you know someone that works or you know someone that knows someone that works there and then go through them and bypass that whole CV screening process. That is the best way to do it. So I'd like to touch on that because we've got two, two questions here, one from Abiram and one from Sonia uh, saying, you know, what if, you're, what if you have no network? What if you've come to Australia, just a recent graduate, you've got no network? I mean, that's common. I mean, we, we touched on it before, but I'd like to sort of ask you, you, know, you, you first, Jared what would be the first thing you would do to build, start building a network in, in, in Australia that every international student can do today? So I'll give you an example of how this has actually worked. There was a young lady, Frances, um, who was Singaporean, who I helped a couple of years ago, and she didn't have a, a big network and she was looking for a job in accounting. So she called it hacking my LinkedIn. She was a job, as a company she wanted to apply for. So. I sat down with her, we jumped on my LinkedIn because I do have a big network in Melbourne. I found someone that worked at that company I knew. So I read, her name was Tanika. I reached out to Tanika and said, hey Tanika, one of my friends, Francis, is gonna apply for a job at your company. Will you meet her for a coffee before the interview? Tanika came back and said, no problem, Jared. I'm happy to sit down with one of your friends. Simple, <laughs> done. Find ways to get around it. You don't have a network here, all right? You've got to find different ways to work around it and to hack the system. 
Francis ended up getting a job at that company, right? So work out some people that you do know and start working with them, come up with strategies about how you can find out the people in an organization. And another tip around that is I think you should go bottom up, not top down. A lot of people want to try and go straight to the CEO or they want to go straight to Lynn. The approach I took with Francis is I actually reached out to someone who'd only been working with that company for 18 months. One, I knew they'd respond because people feel really proud when someone reaches out to them when they're lower level because they, they feel they can offer advice. It's much easier to get to those people and then work your way up the organization. Um, really important graduates or people that are in there for two years, they would love to go and have a coffee with you or during COVID a Zoom meeting with you. Yeah, I really, I actually really agree with that. And in, in, I don't think enough of, yeah, I don't think enough of the uh, lower level staff get asked on LinkedIn to go for a coffee. And they love it when they do. And they love it. I mean, yeah. And, and a lot of them do have influence and, you know, worst case scenario, you've got some advice and a contact best case scenario. You've got a, a, an in and, and you've got some, 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 a friend now who can vouch for you that you're not, you're different. And then they'll go back to their office and say, that guy, that person, they're, they're not the same as the other 400 resumes. They actually reached out directly. So yeah, you never know. I, I totally agree with it. Well, everyone's zigging, you got a zag. And I, I think that that's so uh, Lynn, what would you say to that? Uh, yeah, I think you're, you're both spot on. I, um, I think those networks are, are just out there and it's, it's this word network probably conjures up something that isn't helpful, but mm. just think about connections, who you know, people you meet, mm -hmm. and that can be, you know, through sports, through going to see bands, um, you know, uh, doing classes, uh, I don't know, community groups, all sorts of yeah. things. They're the yeah. people that are going to know somebody. It's not just about who you work with. So agree. Um, yeah. And and I also totally agree. Don't it's don't start at the top. Sometimes it is this bottom up approach, and and I think being open to um, you know opportunities that might be there that might not feel quite right at the time. So you know, there's a school of thought. Sometimes don't say no to anything. Um, you know, mm -hmm. explore it a bit. So. Um, Crikey's, okay. you know, I started work and, and that's an Australian saying, crikey's. <laughs> <laughs> but I started work um, when I was sort of still studying and I was in a hairdresser and believe me, mm. I have no hairdressing skills. But um, I was sweeping floors and, you know, what I had to do was um, work out how to have sort of um, just conversations with people every day. And and I was painfully shy, believe it or not. <laughs> and I really struggled with talking to people, but having to have those conversations and asking people what they were doing on the weekend, because I, that was part of my job, that taught me so much in terms of just, you know, stuff that I wouldn't have learned anywhere else. So um, yeah. it, they're, they're stepping stones. Sometimes they're, they're little stepping stones that are going to take you in another direction. And, and um, yeah. I think that's really yeah, I think you've, you've you've touched on something really interesting there in that in that if you view if you view getting a job as a sort of a desperate kind of I need to get a job or I'm failing then I think everyone can see that if you know what I mean and I think if you but if you approach it like what you're saying is in you know be open to the world have conversations find find contacts find networks just through you know being curious about how to add value then you can really start building a different kind of um, expertise, I guess, as well. It's, it's not just apply, get denied, apply, get denied. It's hold on, let's go talk to everyone. We actually have a question here that I'm really curious about. It's a uh, hi, I work in PR and marketing back home. Uh, and I've been struggling to find work in the marketing industry here. I'm assuming it's Australia. I tried to go for entry level roles in retail and sales, still not even being able to get past the interviews. My CV is short and clear and tailored fit per job post. What am I doing wrong? Is it because I don't have local experience? Would appreciate your advice. Jared, what would you say to this? I mean, I don't have their name. It's anonymous attendee, but what would you say? So interesting that's raised. We, I did a webinar yesterday with Social Garden who, um, uh, with George Glover, who's the CEO of that business. And they are marketing automation and digital marketing business. Um, and I've just posted, a, it's not on our website yet, but it will be in the next couple of days and with Study New South Wales. But we talked for an hour about getting a job in marketing. And so whoever has posted it, I encourage you to go and listen to that. And basically the, the summary of it when talking to George saying, what did you look for? And he said that he finds it amazing that whenever they put up an, a, um, a new role, 
they would get hundreds and hundreds of applications. And he, he said a maximum of two people every time would actually call the office and say, can I please speak to the hiring manager for this role? One or two people, max. And he said 100% of the time, the person that calls up to make that call is guaranteed an interview. <laughs> so don't just go to the job boards and start posting on it. You, you're going to get sick of me saying this, by the way, and just sit back and wait for the best. If you are not prepared to go and research that company, another example George gave is that they do, um, say they do advertising for Toyota. Said, so I would expect a marketer to have gone and analyzed all of our ads we've done for that client in the last six months. And if they sent me a snapshot with their application saying, hey, here's a thought about how we could do some more Toyota advertising, 100% guaranteed to get an interview. So you've got to play the game differently. Don't just sit on the job boards. If you're not prepared to research the company and the people that are behind the company, then you are not going to get anywhere. You've got to put the, mm. the effort in. Hope it's an interesting question. point. Yeah, no, it is. That's a really good point. And, and, and certainly uh, as, a, you know, as, a, as a person who runs a company, I really appreciate it when people take that extra bit of effort and show that they've really thought about it. Like I've, I've gone through an interview process recently where we had to hire someone and we had people who came to the interview who during the interview were saying things like, so what do you guys actually do? You know, in an interview. And I immediately said, this, this, this interview is over. I mean, you're, no, this is not yeah. going to happen. But what, I think what I really love is when this, when this person comes to us and says, look, you don't really know me, but I have examined your company. I've gone over your website. I've, I think these are the five things you're doing well. And here's the five things you, should, you could improve on. And this is for you. This is for free. But it's just an example of the kind of value that I can add if you give me an interview. I mean, right there, that goes right to the top of the pile as someone who is ambitious, proactive, passionate. I mean, it's fantastic. Lynn, what would you say if someone said to you, I've already done the work on Treasury Rhine Estates website. These are the wines that will perform well. I don't think your SEO is up to scratch. Your copywriting could be improved. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a fine line. Um, okay, <laughs> um, interesting. Depending, yeah, what role you're going for um, and how big the organisation is because that might not go down so well, but totally pick up on your point, research the company, um, maybe, you know, Google the CEO, see if he's been posting on LinkedIn, see what, you know, messages he's sending, um, you know, read their annual report. So, you know, yes, have a picture point. of the company. I don't necessarily know that, mm -hmm. you know, if I think about my experience with Treasury Wine Estate, someone coming in to, um, say, you know, I, don't, I think, you know, these wines, maybe, you know, you should forget about the grain for now. <laughs> um, that that might not be um, necessarily perceived well. So it is a fine line um, sure, in going sure. in there and saying, saying good stuff, but, you know, no, no sort of where you yeah. pitch it well. No, yeah. that's, that's, that, that's fair enough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go and criticise the product. <laughs> no. that that's not, that's not going to get you very far in a, no. in a job interview. <laughs> yeah. No, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> but, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, there's so many questions coming in. I really appreciate everyone. I've actually got to, we're going to launch a poll right now just to see what everyone thinks about these these issues. Um, I'm just one second while I just find my. I've got a really good question I want to ask next. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about um, you know some of the three skills employees are employers are looking for. Jared, what do you think about that? I mean, we've got we've got top the top three skills employees are looking for. Well, not not necessarily skills, but but the but the, but the traits, I guess. Um, what do, what does it, the average employer want to see? So this is a really easy question, and I want to use the same word three times, but then I'll put two more in. But attitude, attitude, and attitude. People just want people in their organisation who are enthusiastic and are positive and are determined. Again, I put the extra work in. Like it is actually amazing how much businesses just want those type of people. They will train you the technical stuff. We live in a world now where you can teach people the technical stuff. So what they want is the person that you are and the value you bring to that organization. So attitude, the other one is being a problem solver. There is nothing worse than having problem focused people. Be solution focused, right? So start, and this goes in every day, like everything you do. If life throws you curveballs, which it will, be one of those people that comes up with solutions. COVID is a great example of that, all right? So students, you're studying now, the world's in chaos, and you reckon it's bad being a student. Try being a business owner when a global pandemic happens. 
be focused on how do you come up with solutions? Like people, managers really love it when junior people are being coming up with solutions and bring that to them rather than just being problems all the time. And the other one is software that a business uses. Work out what software the business uses that you want to go and work at. Now, if it's an accounting role, you want to know if they use Zero or Myob or Sage or whatever it is. If it's a marketing role, do they use Salesforce? Do they use HubSpot? Whatever it is, if you know the software, you are halfway there because businesses now, everything's driven by software. So they're the three things that I would focus on. That's really good advice, actually. I mean, if, if you came to me and said, look, I don't, I see you using Salesforce. I've just done a three week online course on Udemy. It cost me $20 and now I understand Salesforce CRM. Bang, much more employable than the person with a master's degree in marketing who I have to train in Salesforce is going to take weeks. So Lynn, what would you say? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I totally get the attitude, Pete, because I think that is that is tops. Um, I did send a link to you, James. I don't know if you've posted mm. it or not, but it's um, an article we'll that put was... it in. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's the latest advice to de-risk de your career post COVID-19. It was just an um, article that was up on LinkedIn, but it's got a link in there to an, the ING report that's just come out as well. And it's um, there's there's so much coming out now that talks about, you know, it's not not always your technical skills that people are going to be looking for, but it is that behavioural piece that's um, that's really um, you know, hitting the headlines now. And if you can work on that, that stuff, which is around your emotional intelligence and your empathy and um, your self-awareness. So developing and fostering those skills. I know I sound very HR, but it's, it's really important. Um, and, and equally, I think because a lot of those, um, you know, other skills that we have are going to disappear in five years, you know, we're not going to need some of those because, you know, the, the word on the street is that we'll be taken over by, you know, some artificial <laughs> intelligence. So it's the things that can't get, um, it's the human things that aren't going to be able to get taken over. So I think also really um, trying to hone some of those skills that um, the creativity, the entrepreneurship, but that self-awareness I think is huge too. So. Yeah. And that sort of touches on what you said at the start, which is really getting an idea of who you are and what you want uh, and, and creating a bit of a, a best case scenario for the, your kind of personality. Mm -hmm. um, if you're shy, don't go into sales. If you're, if you're, yeah. if you're yeah. um, hugely ambitious and creative, perhaps don't go work in, you know, in an in administration or something like that. So I think that's right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd like to, I think I skipped a question here. I'd love to ask uh, Gerard, what, m many of the, uh, the students listening in today currently be studying online. What about the future of online learning? How does that affect, I guess, the future employment opportunities? I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. Whether you've studied mm. online or you went to campus, well, why would an employer care? So, mm. and if you, if you think about it, like employers don't, what Lynn was just talking about, it's not as much about what you've studied, where you've studied. No one's in six and a half thousand internship placements we've done. Still to this date, no one has ever asked for someone's marks. So, <laughs> An employer doesn't care whether you were um, going to a lecture hall or whether you were studying online. What they want to know is how did you adapt to the situation? What did you do when the world got thrown into chaos and online learning happened? Were you one of the people that was complaining and saying life's not fair and you know this isn't how my study's supposed to be? Or did you find ways to adapt? Did you maybe you organized a group of people to meet on Zoom every week to collaborate? Maybe you found some meetups online. You started attending meetups that were being done digitally. Maybe you found um, time to do more self-learning because you didn't have to travel to campus anymore. So you did the trail. You went to Trailhead and you learned how to use Salesforce. Maybe you learned how to go and learn marketing automation. So maybe you did a remote internship. Like what businesses care about is all the stuff you've done outside of your degree. So. For anyone that's thinking, oh, I have to learn online, it's going to infect my employability, it's absolutely rubbish. It makes no difference at all. <laughs> mm. And yeah. I think what, what you're saying there, Jared, too, is what, what that demonstrates is people's um, resilience, flexibility, you know, thinking outside the box, and, and that's what holds you in good stead. And that's what people want to hear because it's, it's, it's what you need in the workplace that people are going to just think differently. Yeah, and they're the stories you tell in an interview. Exactly, I mean, exactly. You, you know, I was, I was a guitar teacher and through COVID, I could no longer go and meet my students. So I turned my yeah. classes online and, and 
that might have nothing to do with the job you're going for, but it demonstrates um, that adaptability, that positive attitude, that solution focus. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think if you, if you approach it and have an understanding of the business at large and understand like what you said before, Lynn, reading the annual reports of these companies and going in there, realizing they have a bottom line to maintain, you, you know, if you go in there thinking I will slot into this company perfectly, uh, you know, just here, that's one thing. But if you come and say, look, I see what you're trying to do here. I see it. It's in your annual report. I see the vision. I get the strategy. Yeah. And I understand that, you know, I can add value in the context of everything that you're trying to do for the, yeah. for the top level managers. That is music to their ears, hearing that this person gets it. They're not just going to be coming to work and doing their job and going home. They're going to think about the whole company as, and, and that's the kind of person you want on your team. Um, all right. Well, I, it's, it's really interesting. Um, Jared, are there any sort of industries that you think, would be, you know, worth looking at for international students in the next, I mean, I, I was looking at Google Trends last week and I saw that, uh, I saw that it was like, um, uh, online dog therapist searches were going through the roof. Um, <laughs> online physical trainers, uh, yeah, online chefs, things like that. There's all these people who, who, are, who are changing the way they consume skills and, and a lot of new businesses are gonna pop up. What do you think? So. Every single industry needs graduates. And so it's, um, it's something for students to understand is that people need the lower level work, right? But it's a matter of, of being able to penetrate into that. And a good example is the waste management industry. Is we work with the industry bodies in waste management. And when I, I did this myself, I fell victim to it. I thought, well, waste management, people don't need more garbos. Like, why do we need people picking up rubbish? And then the CEO of the, of the association said, well, hang on, we need IT systems, we need accountants, we need finance people, we need data analysts, we need supply chain management, we need a sustainability people. And I'm like, oh my God, like this industry, you need absolutely everything, but it's not a sexy industry. And so people don't really look at it. And the reason why I use that as an example is that every industry needs graduates. So as, as a student, start researching these, some of these industries. See what a lot of, we meet a lot of students that want to be part of sustainability, right? And, and it's great. Everyone has a social conscious. It's really terrific that the 20 year olds of today are so socially minded. The waste management industry is terrific for sustainability. So, and the other thing is too, is don't differentiate between being an international student and a local student. I actually wish we did not have the term international student. Whether you were born in another country in a global world, why does it matter and why do we have to differentiate between an international student and a local student? We're just a graduate. Everyone is a graduate competing against all the other graduates. And so I raise it because I think take away this mindset that you're different because you're an international student. You're just a graduate competing for opportunities with everyone else and have that positive and, um, comp and um, confident mindset that you're going to go and work harder than the person next to you. And you're going to go and research the businesses and the industries you want to work in. And you're going to make sure that you penetrate into them. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, I guess from, an, from a student perspective, that makes complete sense. But I guess on the employer side, I guess they do need to know if you're an international student because of the visa uh, issues and things like that that do, that do get in the way of longer term employment for so a lot of these students. So, um, yeah, I can see. I question that yeah. though, James, because they, the average um, time they say someone will stay in a job now is two years. Right? That is now a statistic of how long people stay in a job on average. In Australia, you have post-study work rights of two years, right? So you're actually staying there for as long as what people normally stay in a job. So it is yeah. becoming less of an issue than people think about the whole visa status. Um, people will hire the best person for the job, right? And so it, I think it's being used as a bit of an excuse. Yes, you might have to work a bit harder. There are some companies, being the big corporates, that still have rules about if you're not a citizen, you can't apply. It frustrates the hell out of me. I know it frustrates everyone else. But... 97% of businesses are SMEs and they do not have these rules about visa status. They will hire the best person for the job. So just look in the right places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if you, if you impress the companies, they will like, if you're looking for sponsorship and, and graduate employment, things like that, they're, they're, you, they're not going to do it unless you are showing value. Um, we touched on it before about doing research. I'm having a question here. There's a lot of emphasis on the need to research the specific companies in order to stand a better to stand a better job at getting that job that the interview and hopefully in the long run getting employed. 
how might we be able to do such research? I mean, what, what, what are the resources that you can do? Well, I, I would say start with their website and start with their annual reports um, and, and learn yourself how to read financial statements and things like that and, and, and show there's a lot you can do in the background and a lot of publicly available information uh, around, especially the bigger companies, you know, especially they're publicly listed, they have to produce a lot of information and you, 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 it's up to you. It's up to you to, to get an understanding of, of where that company is heading, where they've been, where they're at right now, and some of the major challenges. Because if you come into an interview, you're going to have a, uh, a much better chance of getting a job if you can tell a story about the company that perhaps the hiring manager may not even know. It, sounds, it, it, it puts you up there. Lynn, what would you say to someone who come in, comes into an interview with a thorough understanding of the company itself? Oh, yeah, definitely demonstrates uh, the stuff I want to see. So I think that's really important. Um, and I, I think maybe some of the questions are, you know, it's good to research the company while you're um, applying for a role. And then definitely if you've got the interview, that's where you've got to go in, you know, really well researched. Um, but I'd, I'd also like the big companies are the ones that are likely to be a bit tougher sometimes to get into. So don't discount all the other businesses that are out there where you can still come in and start learning things. And um, yeah, it's not just those big fours or those, you know, the top, top 100 companies that, that you should be looking at. I think there's as many opportunities because certainly um, coming in on, on the, as a visa holder to organisations, um, it, there are companies, as, as Jared rightly said, you know, they're not going to, they're going to have some policies around that, but um I think the smaller businesses are probably just as open to considering, you know, diversity too in the workplace. And yeah, use and yeah. so for research, LinkedIn, oh my God, is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. behind every decision is a human. Mm -hmm. You've got to yeah. connect with human beings behind the decision making, and mm -hmm. LinkedIn tells you the humans that are connected to that business. Mm -hmm. And try and have a coffee with one of them. Mm -hmm. it, LinkedIn is so powerful for doing this. Yeah, and, and it's, it's something came to mind earlier. Um, people want to help, you know, and I think being approached and being asked, you know, I'm, I'm whoever you are and, you know, I'm really, I've been struggling to find a job, you know, I've, I've found you on LinkedIn. Is there any way we could catch up and have a coffee? I'd, I'd really love to pick your brain. I think people want to help, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've um, over the years been, you know, very open to anyone that's asked me for help. And I think um, generally most people are the same. You know, it strikes me as something, there's something ironic about what we're doing right now in that, in that we, you know, one, one of the best ways to get attention is to interview people that you respect. And I remember when I first started, um, I, was, I started Insider Guides and I started doing doing this sort of thing. I, I wanted to talk to people who had built businesses. So I, we set up a thing, Creative Coffee in Adelaide, where we would just interview, well, I took it as, an, as a chance to interview people who were running really interesting businesses. I put it on Eventbrite and, and made a little event about it. And I just, I, I brought these really interesting people in, CEOs of companies, entrepreneurs, directors of theater companies, things like that. And every week I just interview them in front of a crowd. Um, not, a, not only did I get to learn a huge amount of information from them, but now I've got this network which can be leveraged off in the future. So it, I think what Lynn's talking about is fantastic, reaching out to people uh, who just really want to be reached out to. I don't think enough people get asked, especially some of the lower level staff, and asked to interview them, asked to say, look, I'm really curious to know uh, about, about how you got into this job and what you're doing. I actually had someone do that two, two weeks ago, a university student, it wasn't, hi, James, how do I get a job in your company? It was, I am really curious just about your story. And I'd love to just spend 20 minutes having a chat. And you know, that's a much nicer approach than give me something now to just, let's, let's talk. Let's just talk. There's no, there's no agenda. Just, just looking for a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Jared, what, do you have any extra comments about that? Yeah, I think people love being asked for advice. So mm. if you're trying to get, um, you know, in front of someone and, and don't meet someone and say, give me a job, it doesn't work like that. But people like mm. James just mentioned it. Like when someone says, Hey, I really loved your story. I'd love to get some advice from you. Can I buy you a coffee? I think nine times out of 10 people will say yes to that. Yeah, I um, agree. I, I would say yes to it. And you know, you're a CEO of a company. So am I, Lynn's been in a very lead, senior leadership positions. I know for a fact, Lynn, that you have gone out for coffee with people just to offer advice. Yep. Um, yeah, I think it's a, you know, a, a, 
he, it's like offering a cameo in a TV show. Not people want to do it because they want to get asked to be in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't have the, all the answers or there, mm. there is no one answer to, to your, mm. um, you know, how you're going to do this. It is all about just building, I think, building that network, building, yeah. asking a series of questions and you start to form a picture. Um, it's not easy. And I, I know even um, I would imagine through your unis, um, there'll be career services um, divisions mm. that, um, they might be hard to get to and might seem, <laughs> you know, that that's not always the answer, but they'll be yeah. um, certainly there with free resources too, that they should be able to support people with as well. And, well, and course, there'll be yeah. another network. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, talking about networks, we've got the poll running. I'm about to close it off. 79% of you have voted, which is fantastic. Um, got some interesting uh, results coming here. Uh, please feel free to uh, finish it. But um so question one was, what do you think is the greatest barrier for international students finding meaningful employment? 39% uh, have said smaller local networks and 21% have said resume and interview skills. So it really does touch on what we've been talking about. You know, this idea that, that yes, you've arrived in Australia. Yes, you have a smaller local network. Yes, that is a perceived disadvantage, but it also is an opportunity to, to build. And it starts like what Lynn was saying was about building those stepping stones and really creating momentum and being open to the world around you. So the question two was how important do you, to you is the likelihood of meaningful employment uh, when choosing a study destination? A whopping 84% has said very important. So really getting a job is think you're being, you're thinking about this stuff right before you even come to Australia. Um, and that, and you know, that's, that's not, that's, that's completely reasonable. Um, Interesting, we had one says, if you could save 10% on your course and living costs, would you move to another Australian city now to complete your studies? 61% uh, said, I would, I would think about it. And 23% said, yes, definitely. So that's interesting. 23% of people would, would move cities just for a change in course costs. Um, I, and the reason we ask that is just that they, uh, you know, obviously uh, your study has a direct link to your employability uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes regional areas aren't as great for jobs, but they are cheaper, but then you can get interesting kinds of jobs in those regional areas that might be different to the jobs you can get in cities. So that was an interesting one. Um, and then we wrote, we, would you ever consider studying in a regional center? 53% said I would consider it if my course was available and 18% of you already do. Well, that's really interesting. I'm going to end the poll now and we're going to share the results uh, with you all. So you can um, all have a look at that. But we'd like to move now to uh, the careers of the future uh, and just have a think about that. Lynn, what are your views on the careers of the future and what can students do now to prepare for those future opportunities? I mean, I talked about this with, uh, in an industry webinar I did last week and it seems like 10 years of innovation has mm. been forced upon companies in a 12 month period. And yeah. now they're thinking about how do I get things online faster? How do I change up my retail offering so I don't have people, people have to walk in anymore? Um, yeah. There's so many opportunities. Where, where, where do you think these opportunities are going to lead and how can students take advantage of them? Yeah, look, well, um, I think that the ING report does list out a whole heap of these, uh, you know, careers for the future. There's um, things that we haven't heard of, you know, it's like these jobs are emerging now, like um, financial coaches and um, a whole whole range of, you know, roles that we haven't been familiar with. I think, um, I, again, I, I, you know, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I think all of that sort of what we used to call soft skills, um, but that behavioural stuff is really emerging as the trend and the stuff to continue to work on and develop. Um, so, yeah, where, where the job market's going <laughs> is obviously, you know, down that whole robotics and, um, you yeah, what can we automate and, um, uh, you know, I think how that's going to impact some of the future roles will be really interesting. Absolutely. And, and I think the skills required to do the jobs of the future are going to be completely different. I mean, I don't think even companies know what the next 12 months are going to look like. And they, they're being forced to, to change everything. Jared, what do you think about that? I actually don't even think it's about jobs of the future. I think it's about the jobs of today. Mm. Um, there's still a big gap between what people learning at, at university and, and the demand from industry. And so you don't even have to look very far ahead to look where the opportunities are right in front of our, our faces. 
Um, people want to see that Amazon's announced they're going to build a new robotic fulfillment centre in Sydney. They're going to need thousands of staff. Now, they've said the key roles are, yes, in robotics, but in IT and in HR. Now, these roles have, have always existed, they've always been there. Mm -hmm. And so what students need to focus on is what are the skills that are needed right now? So we might talk about marketing automation and using the Google suite to be able to do that, understanding how to use CRM systems. And if you're an accountant, understanding what the add-ons add are in the zero ecosystem. Um, AI and, and machine learning are all coming in, right? But it's still just writing algorithms. So do you know how to use Python as a coding language? Have you used Tableau for data um, analyst and for, for business intelligence? Or maybe, maybe you're using Power BI. Do you understand the software that's driving it? All this stuff is here now but the skills aren't necessarily there. So start looking, and the best way to do this is if you want it, the lady that said she wants to get into marketing, if I was you, I would try and have a coffee with someone that works in marketing in Australia once a week for the next 20 weeks and just bit by bit and ask them, what do you do every day? What software does your company use? And then in your spare time, start learning that software, start building those skills, start understanding what the skills are that are required today. Just ask people about what they do in their roles and then start learning that stuff. Self-learning is the most important thing you need to do right now, guys. You need to do self-learning. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I guess a lot of the skills that these companies need, they obviously won't have them in-house because they haven't planned for it because this pandemic has forced them to change their business structure. So they're going to be looking around and thinking about, oh my gosh, like, I mean, look at the university sector. They are scrambling to put content online. They were not anticipating. They thought they had more time to do this, but now they don't. That's being forced upon them. Students aren't, can't be on campus or they may have to have some, some problems and some, they're going to have social distancing measures in place for a while. Um, you know, and I, I, was, I, was, I was went to buy some shoes yesterday from Rebel Sport and, and there was a line out the door and then there was another line in Rebel to get to the shoe section. And I just thought, geez, this these companies are going to have to really think about the way that they sell these things because the experience is not there. It's not there anymore in, in retail. Like in, it's going to have to be changed to online, which is going to improve the, the demand for things like SEO, um, you know, digital marketing, digital sales, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just one example, but you're absolutely right. There are opportunities there and a lot of them can be learned now. You can do online courses and you can learn these things now and you can be more employable than the employees they currently already have. <laughs> so you've got yeah, the yeah. <laughs> starting from scratch, but it's better, it's an added advantage. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I would like to uh, just ask you about those online courses. Uh, then do you have any, uh, I mean, there's a lot of there. Uh, should students look to these to upskill and which ones would you, do you think they should look at? Yeah, totally. Um, and like the world's our oyster, isn't it? With Google and, <laughs> and there's not much you can't learn online now. Um, there's obviously your LinkedIn learning, and I know that comes at a fee, but you do get the first month free. So, you know, if you've got, got a month of uh, holidays, sit, sit there and work out what you want to learn for free, and then, then you can ditch it. But don't tell LinkedIn, yeah. I told you that. Um, but, yeah, totally just um, I think there's uh, – Jared probably has um, a list of um, other avenues there. But anything you want to Google and learn, you can um, – mm -hmm. uh, I know that firsthand. <laughs> so you can learn how to do anything these days. The YouTube courses that are there. I actually was uh, just having a bit of a look this week because I think learning, um, and I know the international students have, you know, have done a lot of um, English learning, obviously, but that conversational um, English is what I think is could be really useful too, to um, to make sure that you're developing those skills because we're a bit of a weird bunch the way we um, speak sometimes and um, change words around, and it, so it must be very difficult. Um, and I know that there was a, a something I came. across on just um, online where I thought, oh, that was, there was a couple of people talking to each other, just learning how to speak conversational English too. So any of those sort of skills, I think would be really important to, to develop and spend some time on and make sure you're, you know, having some chats with, um, you know, your Aussie friends in, in, the, in the bar if you can, so you can just be able to have that conversational English style. Garrett? Yeah, yeah and so look, there, there are, Lynn is completely correct. There's never been a better time in the world to be able to learn stuff than there is today. And we now live in a world where it's, it's almost like just-in-time knowledge, right? Where 
when I went to school, and I'm sure the same thing for Lynn, you had to rope learn stuff because the only place to get it from was an encyclopedia. Now you can get information whenever you need it. So now why businesses now want people who can interpret stuff, who can analyze, who can problem solve, like you need to have all these other attributes because knowledge is a commodity. Um, other places where you can go and do courses, Coursera, Udemy, FutureLearn. Um, I mentioned Trailhead before, which is the Salesforce platform. I mean, Salesforce, people that implement Salesforce in the businesses are on $2,000 a day. It, it is a pretty intense course, but you, if you can go through all their learning on Trailhead, there's huge opportunities for people that can actually use Salesforce. HubSpot is another one more commonly used in SMEs, but another really up and coming um, a CRM where huge demand for people that can use HubSpot. They have amazing training on that as well. And then there's, there's specific software. You might want to learn AutoCAD if you're an engineer. Make sure you know Tableau or Power BI or Yellowfin if you want to be in data um, analytics. Um, understand maybe how to use Python if you want to get into data science. So there, there's just an enormous amount that you can go and learn. And there's no excuse for not doing this stuff because it's now so easy. You guys are actually lucky. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's there's some comments coming in about about despite getting all these skills, it is difficult for international students to get in the door. Uh, around, uh, yeah, just in theory, it sounds good to do all this training and to do that, yeah. but they're still they're still facing barriers that that a lot of the local students don't uh, that, that that they don't face. Um, you know, we had someone say, "Look, I disagree with the noted point. We are all graduates, not local or international, because most companies do not want to spend effort and resources in an employee." who in theory is a temporary resident and he's going back to his or, home, his or her home country. Look, that's a, it's a very delicate point and it's, you know, we're, not, we're not trying to ignore it. We have to ex acknowledge that that is, a, that is a barrier. What we're doing here is trying to give you some skills to be able to put your best foot forward and, and give you that confidence so you can do, when you do get a chance to talk to a company, you can really put, it forward that you are passionate, your authority, you know, you know what you, you have, your authority, you know what you're talking about, you're skilled in the right skills. And so you, what you're really doing is boosting your chances of that mm -hmm. employer saying, well, actually, this person is really valuable. I'm going to, I'm going to have a rethink about the way that I can help them. And then, then you can think about other conversations about, uh, about permanent residency and, and sponsorships and things like that. But, yeah. but if, if you say, oh, I'm not going to try because I'm not a local, then that's you know it's a catch twenty two. What what are you going to do? Yeah, you, you, yeah. So I don't know. It's a it's a difficult problem, but I think there is value in still trying to upskill. Only good can come from it anyway. So why yeah. not? That's my point. Yeah, and James, if I can just build on that really quickly, um, I'm, I totally empathise, and it must be a difficult position to be in. But I know in the wine industry, for example, and you know you have seasonal work. And um, don't un underestimate getting that foot in the door. And I've seen that happen, you know, heaps of, uh, you know, vintage workers come along, they're all on visas. And there have been people that have just shone and um, they've ended up getting sponsored and, and traveling the world with the company, you know, so there, there are all often um, seasonal work opportunities that might come in that just give you that foot in the door and give you the confidence too, because a lot of this is about building your confidence and um, so yeah. you feel, feel worthy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is a bit harder, but it's not impossible. And there's plenty of examples of people who have come in at a low level role through good networking, good skill accumulation, good networking, they've built their way up. And, uh, you know, Lynn, you've seen, Lots of these people do that, and Jared, that, that's that's sort of what you're what you're what you're trying to help with, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I I disagree because it, I think you need to focus on the right companies. There are companies out there that won't hire internationals, so don't apply for those companies. No. Like, it's only a small percentage of them, but too many students, I think, focus on the top end of town. Um, you know, and even Telstra is one of these businesses that have uh, conditions around whether you're citizenship or when you've got PR, and and there's plenty of them. Ignore those companies. There are thousands and thousands of companies that do not care where you're from. They honestly don't. And I know because we do it every single day. So it's just about being strategic about where you're applying and adding value. A good, one of my software businesses, we had a, um, a, an IT person, Byron, and his visa ran out. He was going to get, he had to go home to Columbia. So we sponsored him. I said, I don't care what we're doing. I'll get an, a lawyer on the phone right now. We are sponsoring you. And we did because I was not going to let that guy leave our business. I didn't want to lose him. So 
there's thousands of these stories out there. You just got to be a bit strategic about who you apply with and ignore the businesses that insist you have to have PR because there's lots that don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting chat, guys. I am so grateful for your time, but I do want to be uh, courteous and thankful and appreciative and considerate of, of your time as well, because it is, it is, uh, it is one hour now. Um, look, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. And uh, look, Gerard, Lynn, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Really Bye. fascinating conversation. I hope we'll, we'll send an email out after this with all the resources that we all discuss, everything from outcome.life's resources right through to Lynn's resources that she sent through. There's plenty of good things there. I hope you got some value out of that. We will be back next week uh, with more information. I want to thank the Council of International Students Australia for helping us get this off the ground. And I think it's a great great partnership there and uh look please do fill in that survey we're going to send out we'd love to learn more about you it'll help us make our webinars better and more targeted we don't want to talk about things that you're not interested in we want to talk about things that will genuinely help you um please stay in touch we are insiderguides.com.au head to inside hit, head there plenty of information about how to get a job and and plenty of information about life in australia as an international student um yeah we'll be in touch soon and i look forward to seeing you all again Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Bye. See you, guys. Thanks. Bye.